So again, in the textbook, there are periodically at the end of this section exercises, these putting it together problems that help you to sort of see the forest for the trees as far as the big picture of statistics goes. One problem that I think would be helpful to go over is the uh, problem in section 4.3 that talks about building a financial model. Now what this data represents is for the years 1996 through 2007, this is the percentage change in an index of stocks called the S&P 500. So the S&P 500 represents 500 different stocks traded on the U.S. stock exchanges, and it's meant to be representative of how all stocks in the U.S. market are behaving. So, for example, in 1996, the stocks in that basket of 500 went up 20.3%. This S&P 500 is used as a sort of a proxy by which money market or uh, rather mutual fund stock managers are judged. If you do better than the S&P 500, you are considered a good or prolific money manager, and if you do worse, then you uh, obviously you're better off just investing in the S&P 500. So one thing that the S&P 500 is used for is to compute something called the beta of a stock. The beta of a stock represents how much a particular stock's value changes relative to this basket of stocks. So for example, if a beta is one, it means that if the stock market as measured by the S&P 500 goes up 1%, your stock is also going to go up 1%. If a beta is 1.2, it means if your stock goes up by 1%, if the S&P 500 goes up by 1%, your stock is going to go up by 1.2%. And so betas greater than 1 have more market fluctuation than the general stock market. Because if, you're, if the S&P goes down by 1%, your stock is going to go down by 1.2%. Follow? And so ideally, when you build a portfolio of stocks, you want to have some stocks that have betas above 1 and some that have betas below 1. Because stocks that have betas below 1 don't fluctuate as much as the overall market fluctuates. You follow? And so the way you compute the beta of a stock is you collect rates of return of the S&P 500 and the corresponding rates of return of a particular stock. The particular stock that we're focusing on is General Electric. And so we're going to go through these K parts to analyze this bivariate data. And so again, this will summarize the whole process of how we summarize bivariate quantitative data. Okay? So, for starters, you would want to draw a scatter diagram. We're going to treat the rate of return to the S&P 500 as the explanatory variable. The rate of return to General Electric is the response variable. So we go to graphics, scatter plot, X variable is S&P 500, Y variable is General Electric. We're going to plot points. We want to label these. Oops. And give it a title. Create graph. And there's our scatter diagram. And so based on this scatter diagram, what kind of relation appears to exist between these two variables? Yeah, positive association as indicated by the fact that the data follows a linear pattern with a positive slope. Now what we're going to do is determine the correlation coefficient between these two. There you go to stat. Uh, summary statistics and correlation. 
correlation between the S&P 500 and General Electric. And we're not going to do this two-sided p-value just yet. Stay tuned. And we get that the correlation is 0.9423. Now, how do we want to use that correlation? We want to use it to determine whether or not, in fact, there is a linear relation between these two variables. How do we do that? It's Use table two in the appendix. That's right. So our data set has how many observations in it? So we have 12 observations. And so with 12 observations, the critical value is 0.576. Our correlation of 0.942 is bigger than 0.576. And so we know that there is, in fact, a linear relation between these two variables. So now that we know that there's a linear relation, we go ahead and find the least squares regression line. To find the least squares regression line in StatCrunch, you go to Stat, select Regression, and select simple linear. Our x variable is the rate of return on the S&P 500. The y variable or response variable is the rate of return on General Electric. Now, when we do this, we're going to anticipate some of our needs. For example, do we want to do any predictions? In part E, we want to predict the rate of return of GE stock if the rate of return of the S&P 500 is 0.1. So here, after I pick predict, I'm going to put in 0.1 for predict Y for X. We want to save the residuals because we're going to use them. Now there's a little point right there in front. That's why I like putting zeros in front. 0 0.1, I don't know if you can see it. So we're going to save the residuals because we ultimately are going to want to draw a box plot of our residuals to check for outliers. Plot the fitted line because that's fun to see. We can draw a histogram of the residuals because that'll help us see uh, if there are any outliers. We also like to draw a graph of residuals versus the X values because we're going to use that to figure out if there's any pattern in the residuals to make sure that a linear model is appropriate. Calculate. And we get all kinds of output here. Here is our regression line. GE, which is Y hat, equals 0 0.0212 plus 1.5479 times X. There's our correlation coefficient. There is R squared, 0.888. Remember what this means, 88.8% .8 of the variability in General Electric stock is explained by market variability. Variability in the rate of return of the S&P 500, or 88.8% .8 of the variability in GE stock is explained by this regression line. So the regression line does in fact explain a lot of the variability. Remember we wanted a predicted value, right? A point. So we're predicting if the stock market itself goes up by 10%, GE is going to go up by about 17.6%. Don't worry about what this stuff means, that's for later on in the course. Okay? Now, if we click Next, there's your fitted line plot. It seems to fit pretty nicely, yes? Click Next again. There's a histogram of the residuals. Click Next again, and there's a residual plot. The residuals are on the vertical axis. The value of the explanatory variable is on the horizontal axis. When we read the residual plot, we're looking for patterns in the data first and foremost. So if there was a U-shaped pattern, or if there was a straight linear pattern, where it 
you're below zero with the residuals for x small and above for x big, that would tell you you're leaving information on the table, the linear model is not appropriate. Do you see any pattern in this data? No, not really. I mean, remember another thing you look for is the heteroscedasticity, the constant error variance. There really isn't enough information here to say that the errors are getting bigger or smaller as the explanatory variable changes. And the third thing you're looking for are outliers. I mean, this particular value is kind of far away from the rest. It may be that this is an outlier. How can we verify whether or not we have an outlier? Yeah, the box plot. Because look what happened when I did my regression, the residuals were automatically saved here. So now I can go to graphics, box plot, of residuals. And remember, I want to use fences to check for outliers, and we like our boxes drawn horizontally, right? And there's our box plot. Are any outliers showing up? No. I mean, the median being in the center of the box is implying that the residuals are symmetric. Our right tail is a little longer than the left tail, so you might be able to argue it's slightly skewed to the right, but not too bad. And there we have it. Now, one other question that was asked are our interpretation questions, such as if the actual rate of return for GE was 13.2%, when the rate of return of the S&P 500 was 10%, was GE's performance above or below average among all years where the S&P returns were 10%. So remember what we need to do here is go in and predict the mean value of the S&P 500 for GE for that 10% return. So I need the regression line, did you, let's go to a stat, regression, simple linear, and we'll make a prediction. Predict, we did predict X when it was 0.1, right? And when we got the predicted value, the return of S&P was 17.6%, right? So 17... Seven, the actual rate of return for GE was 13.2%. We were predicting the rate, rate of return of GE should be 17.6%. So is this particular year above or below average for General Electric? Below, because the mean should have been, there is 17.6%. They actually returned 13.2%. So because the actual value is below the predicted, that means the actual value is below the mean. And so the S&P, the GE, underperformed what we expected for that particular year. And other things we can do, interpret the slope. What's the slope here? Yeah, 1.5479. Now, betas are typically reported to the nearest hundredth, so beta would be 1.55, okay? So what that means is that if the S&P 500 goes up by 1%, GE stock is expected to go up by 1.55%. See how I said expected? So another way to say this, if S&P 500 goes up by 1%, GE stock will go up by 1.55% on average. Because again, this isn't deterministic, it's what happens over the course of time, right? So on average, it's gonna go up by that amount. Not always, just it, on average. Interpret the intercept if appropriate. What is the intercept? 0 0.02, right? You yeah. see it? 0 0.02. Now there's two 
ways that interpretation of the intercept is appropriate. Way one is that you a value of zero actually makes sense. Does a rate of return in the stock market of zero percent make sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are years when the stock market doesn't change in value, right? I mean, it can go down, it can go up, it could be unchanged. So that makes sense. Do we have data near zero percent? Yes. Yeah, we have data that's below zero, we have data that's near zero, and we have data that's above zero. So we wouldn't be working outside the scope of the model when making this interpretation either. So basically, if the stock market does not change, if the S&P 500 does not change, we expect GE stock to go up by 0.02 or 2%. And by the way, another question was asked is, are there any uh, years where GE's rate of return was unusual? Well, we don't have to look at the data to answer that question. When we say unusual, that would imply that there would be outliers in the residuals, meaning that GE's return for a particular rate of return of the stock market was out of whack with what we expect. And we didn't see any residuals in our box plot, so there really weren't any unusual years uh, for GE stock. Follow? So this essentially explains everything that we could possibly do for regression analysis at this point.